The episode discusses plastic pollution and the efforts of Senator Ben Allen in implementing legislation to address this issue. This week's question really spoke to this feeling that I get a couple times a year, including right around this time mm -hmm. of year, the new year. And tell me if this happens to you, Candace. We put all this energy into helping the planet and, you know, celebrating all the climate change wins. And then we emerge from some like global climate conference like COP28 or some big new study comes out. And I look up and I see, oh, my gosh, we still have so much further left to go. And so in a moment of kind of vulnerability, it takes the wind out of my sails. <laughs> no, I, I totally know what you're talking about, because it's like running at full speed to realize you've moved two inches. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's not fun. OK. Well, I, I appreciate that um, I'm not the only one that feels this way sometimes. I am hoping, though, that this episode kind of relieves some of that dread. I know that's sort of mm -hmm. our whole deal here. <laughs> yes. Um, and it did help me a little bit. So I'm hoping it's going to help all of you, too. Well, let's go ahead and get started then. Our listener this week is Shannon Drayton, and she's a retired architect living in a ranch out in Tehachapi. And she just doesn't get why everyone isn't panicking about plastic. With all this plastic production out there, how do we control it? She points out there is so much plastic and it doesn't disappear. And she wants to stop making it and using it and throwing it away. Yeah, I get it. So what we're going to talk about, though, is the other part of her question, which is... How does legislation happen? What kind of legislation is already out there to help work on this plastic pollution problem? And how, as a everyday citizen, can I get involved to help make this legislation happen? Oh, and boy, Shannon, do we have the guy to answer this for you. This is the Anti-Dread Climate Podcast, your practical, personal guide to protecting the planet. I'm Kaylee Wells, KCRW's climate reporter. And I'm Candace Dickens-Russell, environmental educator and CEO at Friends of the LA River. I get this fear of plastic. I mean, we hear about how it's not just in our beaches and all over the place and in the streets, but it's in our bodies, it's in the animals we eat. And I didn't realize it's gotten so small that it's literally like in the roots of the plants that we oh. harvest and in the air that we breathe, yeah. which is terrible. I thought that and then I took a breath and I thought, mm -hmm. I, how do I escape mm -hmm. this? I can't escape this. <laughs> yeah. So... You said you found the guy to talk about this. Who is the guy? Well, the guy is California State Senator Ben Allen. Yay. He represents. <laughs> so you know Ben I Allen. Do know ben. Okay, he represents parts of LA County, and he's become the face of plastic legislation nationally. And his work on that has affected way more than just California. Even if you don't care about the environmental implications, which you should, there there are massive financial implications. I would. You know, guess that mo nearly every one of my constituents doesn't want that to be a major budget priority, and yet it's becoming one because of how difficult it's it's been for local governments to to manage just all this extra plastic waste. In other words, governments are wasting so many dollars trying to clean up this problem that we've created, and he rather spend that money on you know healthcare or education or other really important things. <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah. Um, so I don't think we need to spend too much time talking about how bad the plastic problem is. Um, and let's get to the part where you tell me what Senator Allen is doing about it. OK, sure. So last year, a bill passed that Allen wrote, and it basically shifts the responsibility to recycle properly from you and me as consumers to the companies that produce the plastic. OK, but all the time I buy stuff that has recycled numbers that don't get recycled in my city or they have the chasing arrows and say something weird like, recyclable at industrial facilities and nobody <laughs> knows what to do with that. You're right. I still don't know what to yeah, do with that. No. And so the reason this bill is important is because those companies will be held responsible to those claims mm. that they're making. A lot of folks out there say, oh, well, our items are totally recyclable. OK, great. We're going to hold you responsible to that claim. And, and, and then CalRecycle, which is the state department that oversees this area of policy, will hold these producer responsibility organizations accountable for meeting these aggressive rates and dates. And when he says rates and dates, let me run through some of them. By mm -hmm. 2032, 100 percent of single use packaging has to be recyclable or compostable. Mm -hmm. And two thirds of it needs to actually get successfully recycled, hmm. which means these things have to actually be recyclable and not have that stupid mm -hmm. like recyclable in some industrial facilities right, somewhere nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the bill requires that we actually have to cut single use plastic by 25 percent. And this might only sound like it's relevant in California, but it's not. Because think about what happened when California banned that sale of gas-powered engines and cars by 2035. Mm -hmm. Well, look at this. All of a sudden, there's all these EV models popping up more than ever before. Uh, right. And so the people in Montana can buy those EV models just Absolutely. like you and I can buy them. Alan made that exact point. 
the bill is now helping to spur global investment. You know, people can't ignore the California market. We're now tied for fourth largest economy in the world. We're about on par with Germany now somehow. So it'll force a mindset and a change in in business practices and product development across the board that will that will end up benefiting the environment nationally and indeed globally. So the idea being here that like people who make plastic forks at Chipotle aren't just going to make special ones for us in California. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It'll be easier for them to change all of their plastic forks across the country, all because of a team of state politicians and their staffers and some local environmental organizations decided that this was a thing that they wanted to fix. Yes. And having on that national level, the Democrats in the Senate working to uh, pass legislation that bans some of the single use plastics that we're using. That's all. That's also all to the good. That's all helping. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about what Shannon can do to support these efforts and future laws that are even tougher. Here's what Senator Allen has to say about that. Call and engage with your legislators. I mean, just last night I was at a, a town hall and a constituent came up to me with an idea that um, you know, that she's been working on with regards to drug, you know, to, to, to health care costs. And she came up to me directly. People reach out directly to legislative staff all the time to bring up ideas and concepts. And my staff, both in Los Angeles and Sacramento, meet with constituents and advocacy groups. The other thing he mentioned, like, you know, maybe you've tried calling your local leaders and you want to see more things happen. Mm -hmm. Find an advocacy group that cares about the stuff that you care about mm. and get involved with them. Because Alan said part of the process of writing some of the plastic legislation that has passed already was to team up with environmental orgs who cared. Maybe they were doing research mm -hmm. or raising awareness or whatever. Leaders rely on those people. And and this is what we do. We're, we're not only as environmental organizations like Five Gyres and the Clean Seas Coalition and Break Free from Plastics and Heal the Bay and, of course, Friends of the L.A. River. Of course. Like, we're not just doing community things. We're also working on changing policy. So when you join those organizations and join their efforts, you're working at a very community level, but you're also part of a larger voice. It's the choir sings louder when you preach to the choir, right? It's a part of the choir singing loudly to change some things at a legislative level. Wait, you just named a bunch of what sound like really cool organizations. Yeah. What are they doing? So Five Gyres, for example, has its an environmental nonprofit that works on the five different garbage patches. You've heard of the Big Pacific Garbage Patch. There's of not course. just one, there are five. And so they're doing education. They're taking students out into the ocean. They're taking big expeditions. And you've got the Clean Seas Coalition, which is a group of all of these different environmental organizations that come together to talk about plastics. You've got the Break Free from Plastics Coalition, which is huge. It's national. And they do so much great, important work and a lot of it with a legislative mindset. Heal the Bay, of course, with their clean beaches and their nothing but sand cleanup and all of the work that they do. And then with Friends of the LA River being my org, we are out there cleaning the river, but we're also talking to people about how the river impacts the ocean ultimately and what they can do about it and why the LA River actually is an important part of making sure that plastics don't make their way to the ocean in the first place. When you say they're writing legislation or they're really involved in actually creating the legislation, what does that mean? Like, are there experts who are saying to the politicians, this is the thing that you should put in a bill? In some cases, yes. So what okay. what I'm talking about there is like, for example, the Clean Seas Coalition. There's a legislative arm of the Clean Seas Coalition where they actually have lobbyists that mm -hmm. the, the organizations are paying a small amount into so the lobbyists can actually go and fight for and advocate for these anti-plastic laws. And in other cases, it's influence, right? Like, when certain organizations, environmental organizations, call their local representatives, they listen because they know those representatives aren't one person. It's all of their members and volunteers and constituents that are behind them. So there's a little bit of power, I think, in working with local groups because they are not they're not alone. They are already in community and in coalition to make this work. I, I keep wanting to talk about your expertise here. What if you fight for something for years and then it doesn't? happen like that must be so frustrating i mean i think think about that that's what exactly what happened with the bag ban right mm. and when you look at the work that heal the bay did to bring the bag ban around it took it took almost a decade right of everyday dedication but then it happened right mm -hmm. and so yes it does maybe sometimes feel that way and that's what we talked about right we've talked about this before the legal route to getting these things done is long yeah and it, it takes a while it doesn't always change but when it does tipping point Right? Mm hmm. Yeah. That's okay. The thing. And the bag ban, you're referring to California's ban of single use plastic bags? That's right. Okay. That's right. So you flooded me with all of this really interesting information. 
And I still think we need to put all this together and some takeaways for Shannon. Yes. So, Shannon, how do you control plastic pollution and how does legislation happen and how do you get involved? Well, legislation happens when politicians are inspired to make it happen Mm -hmm. and they get inspired when you get involved. So call them up, tell them what you care about. And if it's plastic pollution, tell them that. And push for laws that reduce how plastic shows up in your world, right? Banning single-use plastics, holding companies accountable for the plastic that they produce. Push for those sorts of things because that's going to make a difference in what you're seeing day to day. And you can also help make that legislation by joining the organizations that your leaders work with to draft it. Mm -hmm. A lot of them need volunteers to do the research and raise the awareness to make something pass or get it on a ballot. Yep. All right, Kaylee, what's the good news this week? Well, it comes to you in three words. Plastic eating bugs. Yeah, what? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That sounds kind of cool. Well, it sounds pretty cool. It's preliminary. That's my big disclaimer. But Mm. there is this growing body of research that shows different bugs, bacteria, microorganisms can actually eat plastics and break them down. Wow. I know. What? So, So back in 2015... Stanford researchers found a mealworm that actually feasted on plastic foam. And since then, scientists have found more microorganisms that can eat plastics just like that mealworm can. Mm. And there's there's bacteria that eat plastic bottles. There is an enzyme that breaks down the plastic resin. And more recently in Australia, they found larvae in a darkling beetle that survive only by eating plastic foam. They call them super worms. Oh, my goodness. Like they're but, superheroes. <laughs> but how is this helpful? Don't they just like poop out plastic? <laughs> That's what I would think. Right. Yeah. Well, you know how like with uh, composting, the worms eat food waste and they poop out compost? Yes. So yes. it's kind of like that. They eat the plastic and then they poop out sort of the the building blocks that the plastic was made of. Okay. So and they those can are easily broken, more easily broken down. Right. Like Got they break it. down the more giant molecules into their uh-huh. like building blocks, the recipe that made those molecules. And then by breaking them down into those smaller bits, it is easier to then recycle and reuse that plastic again. Well, that's super neat. And it could be useful because even if we use less plastic, we still need it for things like medical equipment, etc. So very cool. I know. I know. 